Good afternoon, everyone. How are we? I can see our, lots of people are starting to join the Zoom, which is really great. We'll just wait another minute or two before we get started, just to give everyone a chance to log on um, before we get started with our webinar today. We can see we've still got lots of people joining, which is great, still logging on. So we'll just hold on another little minute, give everyone a chance to log on, settle in um, before we get started today. I'll be starting off with a little bit of housekeeping, a little introduction, and then we'll be handing over to our wonderful speaker today, Emily Stockings. All right, I think numbers are slowing down a little bit, still some people trickling in, but we are getting there. It's really great to have you all here this afternoon. We're really excited to, to be hosting this webinar and, and chatting all things e-cigarettes and vaping with you today. I think we will get started. I can see the numbers have slowed. Um, so we'll just kick off. So yeah, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Positive Choices webinar series. Um, I'm Dr. Emma Devine, and I'm a researcher here at the Matilda Center for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use at the University of Sydney. And I'm also the project manager for Positive Choices. So a big welcome and thank you to all of our audience for coming today. Before we do get started, um, we are are all coming together from different parts of the country today. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, water and community. So I'm currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and I pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, and I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which you are on and pay my respect to their elders past and present also. Now, before we get going with today's webinar, I do want to go through a couple of housekeeping points. So the first one is that um, as participants at this webinar, you are currently on what's called listen only mode. And this means that we're not able to hear you or to see you. Uh, we are also recording this session and it will be made available through the Positive Choices website, along with the slide, hi slide handouts um, once the webinar has finished. Um, and we will also have a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Um, so as the session goes on, if things come up that you're interested in or have questions about, please feel free to add these questions to the Q&A box or into the chat as well. We'll be having a look at both and, and sort of going through them. So just want to start today with a really brief introduction to what Positive Choices is. Um, so Positive Choices is a website that provides access to trustworthy, up-to-date and really importantly, evidence-based alcohol and other drug information and education resources that are tailored to parents, school staff and students, so really catering to the broader school community. Positive Choices is funded by the Australian Government Department of Health and was developed by the Matilda Centre for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use at the University of Sydney, but in consultation with teachers, parents and students as well. So it's a really collaborative effort, this final product. Um, some examples of resources that are housed on Positive Choices include learning resources. We've got fact sheets, videos, webinars, games. Um, so there's lots of different types of resources. Um, and one of our you know, really popular and important resources is that we also house classroom based drug prevention programs that have been proven to reduce drug related harms as well. So I really do encourage you to visit our website to have a look at some of these resources um, and there could be something really useful for you there as well. But now what we're all here for today um, is today's webinar that focuses on e-cigarettes and vaping in young people. And we are really, really excited to have Dr. Emily Stockings presenting for us today. So just to introduce Emily, um, she is the program lead of smoking, vaping and mental health at the Matilda Center for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use at the University of Sydney. She has 13 years of experience in tobacco control interventions, um, particularly among hard to reach populations that include training clinical staff um, in assessing and treating nicotine dependence in healthcare settings. 
Emily is an expert consultant on vaping to the Department of Health, Therapeutic Goods Administration and the World Health Organization. So big welcome and thank you to Emily and I will pass over to you now. Thank you very much, Emma, for that introduction. It was a very generous, um, very complimentary. Thank you also to the Positive Choices team for inviting me here today. And also thank you for all the people who are participating and who have joined us. I'll uh, just get my slides up ready to share with you. So what I'm going to talk today um, is about everything about e-cigarettes um, and vaping among young people. And hopefully we've got plenty of time at the end to um, answer questions and feedback. I just wanted to, first of all, uh, let people know that I don't have any conflicts of interest to, to declare. Um, I've not received um, funding from tobacco or pharmaceutical companies. Um, I work entirely independently um, in a research uh, context. So what I'm going to cover today, um, a bit of an explainer around vapes, e-cigarettes and pods. What are they? What's in them? Um, e-cigarettes versus combustible cigarettes, a little bit of a side by side, because this is something I get a lot of questions about from young people, also from parents, teachers. Um, how many people, young people use e-cigarettes, a bit of a prevalence update, um, what the regulations are. I think this is also something that's really important to understand. Is it legal? Is it not legal? When is it legal? Um, and then also what happens in the body and also an additional um, important safety information. And then where do we go from here? Who is at risk? How do we support parents, teachers and school staff? And how do we empower young people to make decisions that are best for their health? Then a little bit of up and coming uh, resources, watch this space, and then an ask me anything component where you can ask me anything and hopefully I can answer. So the e-cigarette, here is a nice, it can, I confirm everyone can see the slides okay, um, a nice anatomy um, breakdown of what a, a traditional e-cigarette looks like. They, there's lots of different components and they've um, rapidly changed over time and I can talk about that in a second. But basically working from the bottom up, all e-cigarettes contain a battery. The battery then activates a sensor which activates an atomizer, which is a, a coil, a heating element, which then heats an e-liquid. This e-liquid is contained in the cartridge in that top component there, and it is turned into a vapor when it is heated and then inhaled by the user. So there are lots of different uh, variations of e-cigarettes, and you can see some examples here like mod boxes and sub -ohm tanks and cartridges. The e-liquid is what goes in them, but Basically, they all contain these, these components, the battery to turn it on, which tells you, okay, the sensor needs to activate the atomizer and the atomizer needs to heat the e-liquid. Um, E-cigarettes have, in relative terms, not been around for very long, but they have evolved incredibly rapidly. They started as these cigar-like uh, devices, this first generation that look like um, cigarettes and they were typically disposable. Then they sort of moved away from looking like cigarettes and turned into um, these sort of pen devices, these pre-filled cartridges. Then the third generation, again, moving even further away from, from cigar likes to these tanks or mods, mods, which were quite chunky and associated with that sort of like hardcore use of vapes. The fourth generation um, devices, which are where we are now, are these pod mods or pod devices that are a lot smaller, they're slim line, they look more like USB sticks. Um, and they are of all of the different uh, iterations, different generations, probably the most physically desirable looking, lots of different colors, lots of different flavors. And we can talk about that. So what is in them? Sorry, just having laptop lag. In the e-liquid, this is a, a nice kind of like simplified diagram of what uh, the chemical components in the vapor contain. So we break it down into the three different sources where the chemicals can come from. First of all is the e-liquid. So this is the liquid that goes inside that top part of the e-cigarette, the cartridge, which gets heated up by the atomizer and then you inhale it as a vapor. So in this, there can be nicotine. We can talk about nicotine concentrations in a second because there can be zero nicotine up to quite high concentrations. And then the carriers in, um, 
in the liquid. So these are things like propylene glycol or vegetable glycerin. There are also volatile organic compounds, um, things like ethyl acetate, which has been thrown around a lot, um, the, the compound that is the same as a nail polish remover, phenolic compounds and flavorings. Actually, most of the chemicals come from the flavor component. From the heated element, um, this is where additional chemicals are formed by the process of heating. So these are things like aldehydes, formaldehyde being the most of concern there. This is a known carcin carcinogen to human health and also free radicals. From the device itself, which is an another source of chemicals, there have been um, found in analysis of vapour, um, heavy metals, aluminium, arsenic, uh, lead, etc. So all of these, um, so these three different components can lead to chemicals coming from different sources. Uh, ultrafine particles are also detected in the uh, vapour itself. So just for a side by side, this is an example of a fourth generation uh, pod device. So it's quite small. It basically looks like a USB, even though people don't use those anymore. Um, and an old school analog combustible cigarette. So an e-cigarette heats a liquid to two to 300 degrees. A cigarette burns tobacco at around 600 degrees. So the key difference between an e-cigarette is that it's heating a liquid, whereas a cigarette, it is burning tobacco which is what I just said. Nicotine con content or concentration for an e-cigarette can vary from zero. It can be nicotine free or up to 100 milligrams, 100 milligrams per mil. So this is 10% uh, nicotine concentration. Tobacco cigarettes are sold with a set concentration that varies from 13 to 30 milligram, depending on brand and, and the type of um, tobacco that people are using. An e-cigarette produces aerosols, whereas a cigarette produces smoke. These are two very different things. Um, aerosols are not water vapor. That's one of the common myths that, that I hear. It is. It does contain chemicals, around 250 chemicals as far as we know. This is still early um, analysis of the chemical composition, but it includes those things that I just mentioned. So um, most of the chemicals come from flavorings, heavy metals that have come from the device, formaldehyde, um, ethyl acetate, and, and particulate matter. So ultrafine particles that don't break down and can embed themselves into the lungs. Uh, cigarettes contain up to 7,000 chemicals, tars, carbon monoxide, toxic gases, and solid particles. And we know and we have very good long-term evidence that these are incredibly harmful to human health. So you can see that they are actually quite different. The, the mechanism is similar, but each component is different. We're heating a liquid rather than burning tobacco. It produces aerosol instead of smoke, but there are chemicals in both. I put this quote in because I thought, A, it was quite hilarious, but also B, it's, it's a useful kind of uh, comparison. And it goes, I believe that smoking is more harmful than vaping, but that does not make vaping harmless. In the same way that being hit by a car on the freeway is less harmful than being hit by a truck, but it's not desirable. Um, and this is a quote from uh, adjunct professor John Skerritt, who is um, essentially the, the head of the product regu regulations group with the Therapeutic Goods Administration who, uh, and this was at the Senate Select Hearings on Tobacco Harm Reduction, talking about the relative harm. Basically, the best thing that you can breathe in and inhale into your lungs is oxygen, and anything other than that has, has a different risk. But the relative risk of tobacco and vaping is different. Okay, so moving on to uh, prevalence. How many young people use e-cigarettes? This is a question I get asked a lot. Um, and it also can vary depending on where you are and who you're interacting with and who you see on a daily basis. What I'm presenting here is just a single data source just to simplify things. There's lots of different surveys. What I'm presenting here is from the National Drug Strategy Household Survey from years 2013 to 2019, because that is at the moment the best nationally representative summary of e-cigarette use in young people. Uh, I should note as well um, my slides, just to make them a bit more clean, I haven't put all the references in. I've got a separate version which does contain all the different references, which is what can be circulated just, um, just for reference. So we can see here from 2013 to 2019, what I'm presenting here is lifetime use of e-cigarettes. So this includes anything from just a puff or just tried it once up to regular, 
regular use, so any use of e-cigarettes. And I've broken it down to 12 to 17 year olds, so younger adolescents, and 18 to 24 year olds, um, sort of young people, young adults. Um, the, the prevalence of lifetime use in 2019 for this, this younger group was just under 10%. So this is just under 10% of people trying them at all. But for 18 to 24 year olds, it was closer to 30% ever tried, ever used them in their lifetime. So it looks like a lot when you see it on this scale. But then if we add in smoking status, so this is the same data. You can see those two lines that we just looked at it just down the bottom there, but I've added in smoking status. So for people who said, yes, I've tried e-cigarettes, I've also added in these top two lines of the people who said, but I also use regular cigarettes. So most people who have tried e-cigarettes are already combustible smokers. You can see around 65% for both age groups were already smoking. And this is also lifetime use of e-cigarettes. If we then add on on top of that, so I'm just highlighting that this is smokers, current use of e-cigarettes, we can see all the way down the bottom here that the, the current use, so this is any use in the past month, it could be daily, weekly, or monthly, that the prevalence is quite low. So about 2% or just under 2% um, of, of young people aged 12 to 17 are regular users of e-cigarettes and the number for those aged 18 to 24 it is around five percent just over it. If you then break that down in terms of non-smokers which I didn't do just for the sake of having fewer lines there that the prevalence of current e-cigarette use among people who have never smoked is around one to three percent in this age group. So it is a small number but what is increasingly concerning is the number of people who report current use who are not smokers at all. So these are the people who are not smoking but are starting to use e-cigarettes. Um, and there's lots of different caveats around using national data. Um, also, it, it, the most recent data point was in 2019, and we can talk about that in the chat. Um, it has likely gone up, and it's likely higher in certain settings. So in terms of regulations, um, it is to... Uh, put it nicely, bloody confusing in Australia. We have found ourselves in a bit of an awkward spot um, between uh, New Zealand, who is um, very, um, vaping is very much allowed and is more free regulation. The UK is similar. The US is just sort of like a bit of a wild place. We don't want to go there. We are trying to regulate, but also trying to allow access. So what I did was a flow chart that we can all follow along with. So first of all, are you over 18? If you're not over 18, it is illegal to vape anything. It doesn't matter what's in it, if it's nicotine or not, it is not legal. I should add that I've made this um, as per New South Wales regulations. So in Australia, smoking um, and e-cigarette regulations are managed at the state level and they vary ever so slightly between the states. The main difference is in that WA, um, it is completely illegal to vape no matter how old you are or um, what is in them. So if you are over 18, do you want to vape nicotine? If you don't want to vape nicotine, you can legally vape flavour-only vapes if you are over 18 in New South Wales. If you do want to vape nicotine, however, you need to acquire a prescription from an authorised prescriber, a, a GP, to help you quit smoking. So this is how the government is trying to make the devices available for people who they may help, um, but you need to acquire a prescription. If you do not have a prescription, it is illegal to vape nicotine. If you do, then yes, you can legally vape nicotine in New South Wales. What I'm gonna do now is take these two scenarios, if you want to legally vape flavors only and you're over 18, and um, if you're vaping with a valid prescription, and there are additional regulations on top of that. So let's go with the, the flavors only. So say you're over 18 and you want to vape apple ice. You can purchase flavor only uh, vape juice and devices in retail stores, so bricks and mortar stores as well as online in all states and territories except for WA. There are no restrictions on importing these, so you can buy them online and get them shipped to you so long as they don't contain nicotine and so long as you are over 18. Any flavours, there's no regulations or no prohibitions on the flavours. Um, 
but usage is banned anywhere where you can't smoke. So the um, smoke-free policy, uh, smoke-free workplace policy act, which covers workplaces, indoor, outdoor, depending on where you are, and also cars, e-cigarettes are attached to this legislation. You can't vape where you can't smoke, basically. So going across now to the scenario where you have obtained a, a um, prescription from your GP, you have um, you want to acquire nicotine liquid and vape it in New South Wales. You can purchase this either from a participating pharmacy that has them in stock behind the counter and you, you show your prescription and get it like any other drug, or you can import up to three months supply from an overseas website. It is illegal to sell or purchase or acquire nicotine in any other way apart from this. In Australia, we are allowed to import or purchase up to 100 milligrams per mil, so 10% nicotine concentration, and this is higher than some countries. Um, and flavours are banned if they are, contain an ingredient that we know poses a health risk. Um, so one of the kind of standout most, most known is vitamin E acetate, which was associated with deaths in the US. Um, and also some flavours, like I think it's, um, and other people may know this, cherry, butter, and another one, which might be cinnamon, which are known to, to pose health risks to humans. They, those flavours are banned. And as per um, nicotine-free, use is banned where you can't smoke. And just for more regulation information, packaging and labelling. If it is sold in Australia, and this is only via um, pharmacies, a nicotine um, vape liquid has to contain an ingredients list. It has to contain the nicotine concentration. It's got to have a warning statement on it saying this contains nicotine and nicotine is addictive. And it also has to be child resistant. If you purchase vape juice online, or if you purchase so nicotine vape juice online, or you're buying flavors only, there are no regulations on packaging or labeling. In terms of advertising and promotion, um, in Australia, nicotine, like tobacco, so it is attached to the tobacco um, advertising regulations, cannot be advertised or promoted in Australia. There are some uh, very minor uh, exemptions to that. So if you are a participating pharmacy who is selling nicotine e-juice for those who hold a prescription, you can let people know, so it's not an ad, um, it can only be in black and white, but you can let people know that you're a participating retailer. There's no restriction on advertising non-nicotine e-cigarettes. And the important thing here for, for parents, for teachers, for young people themselves, there's no limits to what you can see on social media, just as there are no limits to the internet or what you see in movies. So that's just something to, to be aware of. We can't control um, anything that's outside of New South Wales um, legislation out, out of our jurisdiction. So what I'm doing here, I did a bit of a, um, here's a, a deep dive into someone who may want to purchase nicotine liquid from an overseas retailer. So what I did, I hopped on Google, I just uh, Google searched high concentration nicotine liquid, and it took me to a uh, very popular New Zealand based site where you could navigate in. Um, I just had to click, am I over 18 years? Just a yes, no button when you arrive to the site. And then you can add anything to your cart. It's like shopping for, for shoes or whatever online. So what I've done here is I've added 10, 250 mil, 100 milligram nicotine salt liquid um, bottles to my car. So this is equivalent to about 2.5 litres of nicotine liquid. Nicotine salts, um, just a side note, it's a just, just different formulation of nicotine. Um, I have to click here to confirm that I'm 18 years or older. And you can see here that there's a component where I can drag or drop to upload my prescription, but you'll also note that this is optional. So all I have to do is clickety-click, confirm that I'm over 18 by clicking, I'm not going to upload my prescription because I don't have to. And then it takes me to the cart and I proceed as per any other purchase. Um, and you'll see that I'm spending a lot of money on um, nicotine liquid, but I get free express shipping to my nominated address. This is how easy it is to go through the process of purchasing it. So then what happens at the Australian end? What happens when it gets here and how is that regulated? The website itself has got some FAQs around prescription. Do I need to upload a prescription? And the response here, nope, 
seriously, you do not need to send us a copy of your prescription. Um, and then they go on to say the TGA recommends a copy of your prescription, but it's not a requirement. And then a second question here, is it, is it a certainty that the ABF, that's the Australian Border Force, will stop my parcel at the border? So you may be aware back in December 2020, uh, the TGA um, and the Australian government declared it illegal to import nicotine unless you had a valid prescription. And this was uh, brought into effect in January in 2021. So how, how is that enforced? Um, well, the insight here from the website, you know, the person is asking, is it going to be intercepted when it then breaches the Australian border? Absolutely not. It's not a certainty. From a logistics standpoint, what would have to happen is that every parcel that comes in needs to be opened and inspected by an Australian Border Force officer, confirmed that it contains nicotine liquid, and then checked to see if a prescription is uploaded and attached to that box. In effect, the, the sheer volume of, of packages that are coming, even from this one retailer alone, which is a very popular retailer, is sort of in the, the, the tens of thousands a day. There is just not enough human power at the Australian Border Force end to do that in a realistic manner. So here they're saying it is unlikely that your parcel is going to be intercepted. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about uploading a prescription. It will come to you probably pretty quickly as well. And we can talk about that and um, enforcement and compliance uh, later if we've got time. So what happens in the body? When vape juice is heated, it's vaporized, it's inhaled, it then goes directly to the lungs. Um, this is where it hits first and this is how it enters the bloodstream. Once it's in the bloodstream, it rapidly travels to your brain. Nicotine in particular is a very effective drug. It can go from um, inhaling to your brain in less than 10 seconds. So what then happens in the lungs if this is the first place where the, the vapor is hitting? That small particulate matter that I talked about earlier may be deposited into the lung tissue. And this can form essentially globs or, or shadowing in the lungs, which, which looks like pneumonia. And you may or may not have heard of EVALI. This is an acronym for e-cigarette um, and vaping associated lung injury. And this is something that was seen um, first in the US, whereby people were presenting with symptoms like shortness of breath, cough, chest pain, gastrointestinal, uh, gastrointestinal upset, and other nonspecific symptoms. And then on assessing the lung tissue, identifying that th this was essentially a type of pneumonia that was associated with in most cases, um, a particular chemical compound, vitamin E acetate. But recently, and it was actually associated with 68 deaths in the States and almost 3,000 individual cases, and this is continuing to be monitored. In Australia, you may have seen in the news um, that we have had our first, I think there've actually been a couple now, um, Evali associated deaths. Uh, not from this particular vitamin E acetate, but more the experts believe around the, um, the depositing of particulate matter in the lungs, which is causing this pneumonia type globbing to occur, which is pretty concerning. Another major harm um, that, and a question that people ask is, is everyone going to be addicted to nicotine and then start smoking? So from the government's perspective, we have done an amazing job, an incredible job at tobacco control. Our tobacco rates have halved since the 1990s. And this has been from a multi-component approach to tobacco control, excise rises, public health campaigns, um, plain packaging, graphic health warnings. We don't want, well, the, the government does not want this to be affected in any way. And e-cigarettes are something that may affect the, this positive change in, in tobacco use. So is everyone gonna get addicted to nicotine and then start smoking? I don't know about you, but I get my news from only very trustworthy news sources, such as the Batuta Advocate. Um, and this article popped up the other day and my supervisor circulated it to me and we had a little chuckle. Uh, Western culture makes seamless transition back to everyone being addicted to nicotine again. Poking fun, this is a parody newspaper, um, a tutor advocate for those who are not across it, uh, poking fun at the prevalence of, of nicotine consumption and how we're sort of like, this is, this is smoking 2.0. But is it? Um, and does it increase the likelihood of subsequent tobacco smoking? 
to answer that question, we need to understand what's happening in the brain. So I'm going to do a quick uh, 101 nicotine addiction um, explainer here. So nicotine, in our brain, we have naturally occurring nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which are associated with the transmission of neurotransmitters that are associated with positive mood, relaxation, and also stimulatory effects. So these are things like serotonin and dopamine. Nicotine mimics the release of this, uh, mimics these, these neurotransmitters. So what happens is when you um, inhale nicotine in whatever form, it actually increases the signaling of these neurotransmitters in the brain. So you get that increased positive, um, calming, um, stimulatory effect in the short term. But the brain, in most cases, is pretty clever. And what it does is it realizes that it's essentially getting those um, receptors from somewhere else. So it compensates by reducing the number of nicotinic receptors. So you then need more nicotine to get that same positive response. And this is essentially the, the nicotine addiction cycle. You then get that drop in the available neurotransmitters. You get and that's when withdrawal symptoms start to occur. And then you re-inhale your nicotine. So you get that same positive feeling. This is, um, nicotine addiction is the most common addiction in the world. Um, it is one of, it is the most addictive substance in the world. Um, and it's predominantly due to how effective nicotine interacts with this process in the brain. The adolescent brain, in particular, is particularly vulnerable to this, this process, this cycle. Young brains are what we call plastic. The, the synapses, the connections that are occurring in the brain are still forming. They can still be molded. This is why young children and adolescents and teens are so good at learning new things, such as languages, because those connections are still there. They haven't started to what we call prune. They've not been um, trimmed yet. So if you introduce a substance like nicotine early during this formation process, it can have long lasting effects on the way that the brain functions. In a sense, early nic nicotine exposure can wire your brain to be more addicted to nicotine. So that, that process, that withdrawal cycle, that the way that the brain is responding to nicotine is different if you have early exposure. We also have evidence that um, early nicotine exposure can increase the likelihood of comorbid substance use. And this is because that, that cycle, the nicotine addiction cycle is very similar to other drugs. Um, it's also been associated with memory impairments and the onset of other mental disorders such as anxiety, depression, because that same process um, with serotonin, with dopamine is associated and involved with um, the onset and the action of mental disorders. So one of the other questions I get around, is everyone going to smoke? Um, is the reduction in smoking off, uptake being offset by vaping? Are, as people stop smoking, is it because they're vaping? Shorter answer is most likely no. These two behaviours appear to be distinct. Secondly, and going back to that first question, will young people who vape start smoking because they crave nicotine? Initial evidence suggested a two to three-fold increase in smoking after vaping. But I don't think it's that simple. There are shared genetic and personality risk factors, which mean that people who vape are the people who are probably smoking anyway and have additional risk factors like sensation seeking that make them vulnerable to using e-cigarettes. So I don't think it's as simple as you vape and then you smoke or vice versa, but that for some people, there is a shared risk factor, which means they're more likely to engage in both behaviours, but also early exposure to nicotine when people aren't smoking at all may increase your susceptibility. So I think there needs to still be some untangling there, but, but a clean cut, you're three times more likely to smoke. It's more complex than that. It's not as simple as that response. So more important things to while we're talking about e-cigarettes and health, um, nicotine is a poison. Ingestion of nicotine can be fatal. So this is why the TGA, the Department of Health, Australian Border Force are so concerned around um, nicotine and have such strong regulations around it. Because if 
in the wrong hands, it's ingested, particularly in large doses, it can kill you. Um, I was involved a couple of years ago in monitoring um, poisons, so people calling up poisons information centres and looking at nicotine exposures, and most of them are occurring among young children, very young children, toddlers and babies, in an, accidentally. So they're going to mum or dad's handbag, who someone may be legitimately using um, e-cigarettes to help them quit smoking and looking at something that's quite colourful and attractive and drinking it, and this is a, a, a real risk. So nicotine is a poison and is uh, regulated for that reason. It's a Schedule 7 poison. The devices themselves, they are getting um, more advanced, more safe, but they can leak, they contain a liquid, they can get hot, that's what they're supposed to do, they can even explode. Um, I recently gave a talk at a boys school in Sydney and there were, we had a bit of a chuckle but also a little bit of a ooh moment um, when I explained that there is, a, there a category dedicated to burnt genitalia among young males who have their devices in their pockets and they explode. Um, it is something that can happen um, and it can be rather unpleasant. I talked about um, package regulation. So ingredients can be completely mislabeled or not known at all. And this includes nicotine. So just because it doesn't say it contains nicotine doesn't mean it doesn't. Um, from what we know about intercepted parcels at the border um, and from seized illegal um, e-cigarettes that are being sold by retailers who are not supposed to, the vast majority of devices and of liquids um, contain nicotine. Passive vaping, like passive smoking, can also be harmful. You're just getting less of a concentration. Um, but what's in that vapour, when you see it, is the same as what's going in to your lungs. So there is some um, harms associated with it, but much less so than passive smoking. So where to from here? Essentially, if we reflect um, on the kind of situation at hand, we have got... Um, increasing use of, of e-cigarettes in young people, small percentages, but increasing. Um, regulations are tight, but they're easily circumvented. I could order, as you saw, large quantities of nicotine e-liquids either for myself, or then I could sell them to people who want them, um, completely circumventing the need for a prescription, age restrictions, etc. So where do we go? What can we do? My perception, my um, approach is the best defence is self-defence. So empowering young people, empowering teachers, um, school staff and parents to try and prevent the uptake and reduce the use of e-cigarettes in young people. So the important next steps for prevention and early intervention. Um, firstly, we need to see who is at risk. Are there particular groups of people who may be more susceptible to using e-cigarettes? And let's make sure that these young people are adequately supported. How do we support parents, teachers and school staff when they're faced with a seeming tidal wave of vapes left, right and centre? What do we do? How do we start conversations? What do we do? in the school curricula. And then finally, how do we empower young people to be able to say no um, and essentially not want to use e-cigarettes in the first place because that is the safest thing for their health. So breaking this down, identifying at-risk groups. Unfortunately, this is the case for most other drugs and also risky behaviours, boys, are significantly more likely to try e-cigarettes than girls. Um, and this is just something that is consistent across all other substances. School performance is also a strong um, correlate of use. So low school performance, being out of school, so disengaged with schooling or at a disadvantaged school, also a higher likelihood of, of using e-cigarettes. And these risk factors are relatively non-specific. These also predict other substance use or, or experimenting with other substances. Age, we've seen that both from national data and also anecdotal evidence that um, use increases with um, advancing adolescence. So it's not so much the um, younger kids, but the, the older sort of like 18 to 24 year olds that um, are showing increased use. Economic status, um, so young people who are in employment um, or from higher socioeconomic status backgrounds have lower use. 
And tobacco related factors are also really important. So if a young person is experimenting already with smoking or they have friends who smoke or live with a smoker, um, they are all at higher risk of using e-cigarettes. So how do we go about supporting parents, teachers and school staff? And just first of all, to say that um, it's hard, it is difficult. You're faced with um, you know, something that is changing incredibly rapidly. All of a sudden we have a substance that is appearing in, in the internet age. Um, we've got social media influences. Um, how do we infiltrate all of this information? First things first, know the facts. Um, training and education resources, make use of them um, so that you are able to have a, a fact-driven conversation with a young person. Do you know what they're vaping? Find out so you can have very frank, non-judgmental, fact-driven conversations. So some good sources of information, and I will make sure that these are available afterwards. Um, I can do a longer list. Um, New South Wales Health have recently launched a Do You Know your, What You're Vaping campaign. So there's a portal with various other fact sheets um, and different components that are available for school staff and also parents. Um, New Zealand Health also have some really useful information around vaping and young people. And again, sort of broken down into um, section for parents, section for school staff, section for young people. So making use of these um, existing resources. For schools, vaping-related information, skills-based training can be incorporated into existing alcohol and other drug educational curricula. And I, I'll talk about um, what's being developed at the moment. Um, here is just a little example of a fact sheet um, developed by New South Wales Health um, from the Do You Know What You're Vaping campaign. And the idea is that upskilling and educating parents um, and teachers and school staff so that when you do find something, it be it a vape that basically looks like a USB. You've got a bit more understanding about what it contains, where it might have come from, how strong the nicotine is, what it does to your body. Um, so then when you speak to someone, it's not just, you know, slap on the wrist, not that we do that, naughty, naughty, but this is why I'm concerned. This is what I know about e-cigarettes. I'd also like to make a plug for the Positive Choices portal, um, and Emma did this at the start. So there are also fact sheets available there, which you can make use of. Um, and there are different sections for teachers and schools, parents and families and students, um, with additional information about e-cigarettes, about vaping, all the different names, the different types of devices. So making use of this portal as well. The next thing, which is really hard to do, uh, and I empathise with people who have teenagers, I don't, I have a three and a one year old and I find it difficult to talk to them. So starting a conversation is key, but it is really hard, um, particularly with teens. First things first, make sure you're confident with the facts. So upskill yourself so that you can have a, um, you can stand firmly around what you know, and this is fact driven. It's not, I think it's bad because, or um, my perception is this. It's this is what is in them. This is what can happen to your lungs. This is what can happen to your brain. The second step is finding the moment. Um, and this can be really difficult, but some e examples may be you see someone vaping, you might be out shopping, um, or you walk past a vape shop, or you hear about it in on the news or in social media, or if it's school, they're caught with a vape um, or with vape paraphernalia, that could be the moment to start that conversation. And then the third step, have the conversation. Um, some useful tips is open-ended questions, showing interest, letting them talk and expressing in their words why they're using. Um, using kind of prompting questions to understand their behavior. What do you enjoy about vaping? How does it make you feel? Um, can help tap into why they're using. For most young people, it is curiosity. I heard about them. I wanted to know what the fuss was about. Um, and that's why I tried it and I've only tried it once. For most people who have tried e-cigarettes, it is very occasional opportunistic use. They have, they use it once. Um, if it is something around anxiety or nervousness or stress or low mood, um, you know, I've got so many exams coming up and someone said it will help me feel more calm or it will help me with my attention. You can then start prompting, this is a separate behavior. 
how can I help you when you feel like this? What are some other things that we can do? What do you wish was different? You know, what can we modify apart from using e-cigarettes? Um, and I put a link in here and I can compile these as well to a site um, which has got really useful questions for how to ask um, young people about their behaviours and when they're, they're feeling low um, or vulnerable. And then listening with patients, which can be really hard. Um, again, if they say, oh, it, you know, I love the flavour and I feel really cool, um, we have to, you know, let them be heard uh, rather than being dismissive of that. Okay, so you like the flavours, you know, it makes you feel cool. I, I hear you, I understand that. But here are some other ways I can meet those needs and this is why I'm concerned. And then conveying your own expectations. Why don't you want them to vape? Why are you concerned about the risks? Um, and focusing, I find, on, on medical, you know, the, the, the facts. This is what is happening in your brain and you can't see that. This is what might be happening in your lungs. And I'm just worried about you. Um, and look, all of this could go to hell, in a, you know, when you actually sit down and, and speak to your young person. But kind of following that, that general um, kind of infrastructure of start with facts, engage openly, respect their responses, and then kind of incorporate what you expect from them may be a good way of approaching that. When it comes to schools, um, ideally we'd have a, a shovel-ready intervention that could be incorporated into curricula that's part of their PDHP um, component at school. We don't have that yet. But what we do know, what they should um, have in them what they should contain is more than just education. Education alone is insufficient for changing behaviour and we know that. So incorporating um, theory of bland behaviour and behavioural intentions is something where it, that um, these modules need to include. So understanding attitudes and, and um, trying to change people's attitudes about these substances. What's good and what's bad about, about vaping? Um, relaying subjective norms, the social influences around the behaviour, um, and also um, empowering behavioural control and self-efficacy so people, young people feel um, confident enough to say no. These should also be personalised, um, using anecdotes, um, where possible rewards for quitting, and these should be achievable, and use different formats, so one-on-one, -on -one, group settings, in and outside school, and using mobile apps. And finally, and importantly, not delivered by parents or teachers is something that's come up from focus groups. Some uh, peer counsellor or someone external who's seen as an expert may have more authority um, in this sort of setting. I'm going to go quite quickly through the final um, slide because I know we've only got about 10 minutes left for questions, but just to let you know that we are at Matilda currently developing a few different modules for vaping. So our futures um, is currently undergoing uh, early stages of development for a vaping module, which will hopefully be able to be embedded into schools. We're also working on a campaign with some uh, very talented animators called Respect Your Brain, which focuses on the effects on the brain from vaping, which will hopefully be launched uh, later this year. And the Department of Education, I know, is undergoing um, some rapid reviews at the moment to develop some strategies for schools. So I'm going to open it up now to questions, um, and there may be uh, not enough time, but hopefully I can also answer them offline. Um, and just a quick thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. That was a really, really incredible webinar. Um, I got so much out of it. And I know a lot of our audience did as well. There's loads of really positive comments coming through. Um, lots of really good comments about your slides and your charts as well. So they were very lovely. <laughs> um, I will just take over your screen share for a quick little second um, and just pop up, just directing people to the Q&A box where um, Emily and I will be going through the questions. Um, and answering some of them for the next 10 minutes or so. But to start us off, I've, some have already come through, so I will put some of them to you now, Emily. Um, so you obviously went through the regulation, which was really helpful, so sort of statewide, um, so national and sort of by state, but we did have some questions specifically about Victoria and how similar Victoria was to New South Wales. As far as I'm aware, and I'm not fully across the regulations, so do excuse me, but Victoria and New South Wales are very, very similar in their regulations. Um, I know that quick 
Victoria, which um, is involved with tobacco control regulations are maybe a little bit more advanced in terms of their uh, educational resources for young people. But yes, um, the regulations are very similar, if not identical. But I can do a quick background fact check on that. Wonderful. Thank you. And then a lot of the questions that were coming through were sort of off the back of the regulations that you introduced. So the big problem, I guess, that a lot of people are seeing and you touched on yourself is that we have these regulations, but they're not really being enforced and they're not being, um, you know, there may not be the right penalties or it's all just seems to be slipping under the radar a little bit. Um, so some of the questions uh, specifically were around what sort of penalties are involved. For example, if your hypothetical shipment of nicotine had been stopped or what are the, you know, what are police issue? Are they issuing fines to underage people who are caught vaping? Things like that, if you could expand on a little bit. Yes, so there are, that's a really good question. Um, and it's something that isn't in the media very much, so we don't get much exposure to it. But um, so New South Wales Health um, do go on enforcement activities. So they go to bricks and mortar stores um, and also Australian Border Force are inspecting packages. Um, so I'm just looking at some stats here. Um, more than a million worth of illegal e-cigarettes and liquids um, containing nicotine have been seized this year. So this is via border force, but also by um, basically going into stores um, and obtaining uh, illegal nicotine. Um, and more than 3 million of these banned products have been found since July 2020. The, um, the fines, the personal fines differ depending on whether you're an individual. So say if you um, bought nicotine from that online retailer that I showed you and it was intercepted, um, it's unlikely that you would get a personal fine. Um, I'm not 100% sure. It's more likely that in the first instance the um the producer the sorry the website would then get a, a warning to say you know a prescription wasn't uploaded you know this is what needs to happen um but yes there are personal fines you can on the spot be fined for using nicotine um they range in it's typically a, a monetary fine that's sort of like in the low thousands of dollars um, but there is also jail time associated mostly though with retailers um, really good question i'm not fully across it but yes fines do occur they do not occur. frequently not as frequently as the behavior is occurring because the, the scale is just so big yeah yeah i guess it is just it's a manpower thing as well isn't it to catch so much of it that's going on um just off the back then of retailers we have a question coming through about um so you mentioned that the sale of vapes is okay in pharmacies um but obviously they're being sold in, in lots of other sort of you know, different retail shops. Um, is this, are these just the flavoured ones? Are these nicotine ones? I know you mentioned as well, they probably do have nicotine, even if they don't, but I guess the vapes that people are seeing as they're out and about, what are they? Yeah, the, so if you go into like say a 7-Eleven or like a convenience store, and if you know the name of a nicotine pod device and you ask at the counter, um, you may be you may be provided with that. So yes, they contain nicotine. Um, these are illegal sales, under the counter sales. Um, they're quite common. Um, just because you're getting it under the counter at a retail store doesn't mean it doesn't contain nicotine. It's highly likely that they do. Um, and yes, I can see there's a comment there, service stations, um, very easy to get them. Yeah, they are, do seem to be really widely available, don't they? Mm. Um, another question that we had that I thought was really interesting as well was whether you knew of any research on the effects of vaping on oral health. So obviously smoking and oral health is, you know, not good. Are there any sort of similar patterns emerging for vaping so far? Really good question. Um, and yes, there is a solid evidence base for tobacco smoking and, and oral health. Um, I'm less across the evidence in in vaping. Um, there is a really good review, and I can do a quick um, background check on this, um, produced by Emily Banks at the ANU that goes through all the individual health harms. Um, I'll include a link to that. Uh, but yes, I believe there are some emerging harms. One of the most common um, ones is the throat irritation that occurs from inhaling uh, the vapour. Um, but whether that then turns into longer term harms, such as throat and oral cancer, I'm not 100% sure. Um, and also, we just don't have enough 
there's not been enough time to, to fully assess that yet. Um, but I will put a link in to that very comprehensive report. Um, and digestive issues, yes, can also be related um, to that. And that's covered in the report too. Yeah, no, it's scary. And I guess, as you say as well, it is such early days with all of this. So we are probably going to see more and more um, sort of negative outcomes emerge with time and the longer people are using them as well. Yeah. Um, right. And another comment we're, we're getting a lot of, and I know this is something that Positive Choices has been emailed about quite a lot as well, is how prevalent this is in schools and how much teachers and other school staff are really struggling to monitor it, to address it, um, you know, and it's sort of running away with itself a little bit. And, there, and a lot of people are looking for um, advice on some immediate things that they could really implement now. I know we have our futures modules coming down the line and all of these wonderful resources. But if there was any advice you have for, for tomorrow for them to start today with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I recently gave a talk to a school um, and it went really well. I was so impressed with the insight of the students, but so much misinformation. So I'd say step one may be providing um, some very much non-judgmental information around vapes. This is what they are. This is what's in them. Um, in addition to, um, and I can see some comments now around actual restrictions, so uh, vape detectors and alarms in toilets is something um, that I have heard of in schools. Um, checking, going back over tobacco control policies within school settings. So, you know, rewind back to when it was cigarettes and other contraband that was coming into schools. How was that dealt with? Do we need to do a bit of a revive of what the policies are? Um, but yes, we're, we're currently living in a world where if they want to get them, they can. Um, if they want to bring them to school because they are so small, they're so insidious, they can. So starting with peer-driven, peer-empowered interventions, I think is really important. We can try to stop young people from doing things, but they just always seem to find a way. Um, it is, I can understand from a school's perspective, we want to you know, is there something we can do, you know, like to stop them at the gates? Um, it's inc incredibly difficult. Um, and I'll happily share information as I continue engaging with, with schools to see what their strategies are. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, definitely a watch this space. Yeah. Sort of a thing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I know we are running out of time and we have loads of questions come through. And I'm really sorry we aren't going to get to all of them today. So do I'll pop contact details up once we wrap up. There is just one more I think we might get to before we finish today. Um, so the talk today focused really heavily on nicotine and vapes. But we have had some questions through on um, THC vapes. Mm. Um, prevalence rates in Australia, are they as big a concern as the nicotine ones at the minute? Yeah, so prevalence rates in Australia are pretty low for THC, um, predominantly because it's harder to get. It's a different story in the States where um, less so THC, but more the other cannabinoids, so CBD, which is the non-psychoactive component of, um, of cannabis, are included in vape juice and they're much more readily available to get. So in Australia, if someone is using um, THC or other cannab cannabis in their vape juice, um, first of all, it's, it's, the prevalence is very low. Um, I'd say it's less than 1%. I'd have to check that, but it would be very low. And secondly, um, the only way that we can currently get it is through the, the dark web. So um, basically where other people, where young people can access substances through um, not the surface net, but the dark net. Um, we know that um, of the nicotine, the e-liquid sales on the dark net, it's predominantly THC. So yes, it exists. It is not super common. Um, and also there are emerging um, e-liquids that contain other drugs such as MDMA and opioids. So this is sort of like the next wave of concern is the uptake of, of THC. It's quite minor at the moment, um, but it is something that, that will be a concern as it becomes more available in Australia. Yeah. As it maybe breaks through the same way the nicotine mm -hmm. rapes has. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Emily. Um, again, I'm really sorry to everyone whose question wasn't answered, but let me just get some contact details up um, so that you can send through if there's anything we haven't got to. I did try and group together as many questions um, as I thought we could. Um, but yeah, huge thank you to Emily for all that you've brought to this webinar, for answering all of the questions and all of your knowledge. It was really, really wonderful. Um, and thank you to our audience for joining. And just a reminder that the slides will be made available after the webinar as well. Um, feel free to reach out um, to 
um, info at positivechoices.org.au if you have any other questions um, and we can get you in touch with Emily as well. All right. Thank you, Thanks, Emma. Emily. And thank Bye, you everyone. everyone for your questions. Bye. Bye everyone.